to stay within the Soviet Union. He told the Ukrainian parliament it would face what he called the hopeless course of isolation if it broke away to form an independent republic. President Bush was in the Ukraine at the end of a two-day summit with President Gorbachev in Moscow. The Kremlin snapped its smartest salute for George and Barbara Bush this morning as they came to say goodbye to the Gorbachevs. It was the end of a round of summitry both sides are seeking to present as a triumph, a watershed in relations between the two countries. Mr. Gorbachev said another level had been added to the new structure of friendly relations. And Mr. Gorbachev's parting words, we've done good work. Mr. President, I shake your hand as a friend. There was a band to see him off, and on his flight to the Ukraine, he paid tribute to Mr. Gorbachev. Dealing with a man who's coping with enormous problems and handling them well, and uh, who, he's a man that just inspires great confidence in you. It was a message Mr. Bush took with him to the Ukrainian capital, Kiev, where pro-independence demonstrators reflected the growing nationalist feeling. Some had hoped the president would support their desire for a rift with Moscow. But when he went to the Ukrainian parliament, he warned separatists against what he called the hopeless course of isolation. We will not try to pick winners and losers in political competition between republics or between republics in the center. That is your business. That's not the business of the United States of America. Mr. Bush's last stop here was at Babi Yar, the site of the Nazi massacre of 200,000 people, mainly Jews. The president, flanked by two U.S. Marines, paid a silent tribute. This has been a successful visit for Mr. Bush. He's dampened what he called the fireworks of superpower confrontation and made it clear America will give economic backing to Soviet reforms. But as he headed home this evening, it seemed the person he'd helped the most was Mikhail Gorbachev. Tim at ITN, Moscow. Phone charges are going up again way back to Washington this evening from the Moscow summit. This afternoon he became the first American president to address the parliament of a Soviet Republic when he spoke to deputies in the Ukraine. He said he understood why the republics wanted democracy after years of restraint but he urged them to support President Gorbachev's reform program. Earlier in his farewell to Mr. Bush, Mr. Gorbachev said he was convinced that the Cold War would never start again. Bill Turnbull reports from the Ukraine. Fond farewells in Moscow today and final words of friendship from the two superpower leaders. With the signing of the START agreement, Mikhail Gorbachev was convinced the Cold War could never begin again, while Mr. Bush stressed his optimism in the future of Soviet reforms. Then for the Americans, on to Kiev. George Bush came to the Ukraine to exercise the United States' new twin-track diplomacy. Fresh contacts with the republics are as necessary these days as friends in the Kremlin. The welcome was warm and widespread, but composed largely of nationalists opposed to the Ukraine's communist government, which chose today of all days to bring back food rationing after a two-month interval. It did not go down well. I would like the president to help us. I would like our stupid government to listen just a little to President Bush. They may not have had the time. The president's talks with the Ukrainian leader, Leonid Kravchuk, were short and insubstantial. The communists' hold on power here is unlikely to last, and the Americans know it. Mr. Bush's message today was for all the republics, not just the Ukraine. He told the parliament here the United States would support all in Moscow and elsewhere who pursue freedom, but they'd have to do it on their own. We cannot tell you how to reform your society. We will not try to pick winners and losers in political competition between republics or between republics in the center. That is your business. That's not the business of the United States of America. And there was a cautionary note for rebel republics such as Georgia and Armenia torn by ethnic unrest. America, he said, would not support those who pursue a suicidal nationalism based on ethnic hatred. One last somber moment, a visit to the memorial at Babi Yar, the killing field where the Nazi occupiers butchered tens of thousands of people during World War II. With the summit now over, it seems everyone's a winner. George Bush has made his points about political and economic reform, 
Mikhail Gorbachev has shown his country he's still the man the world wants to deal with, and the republics have won formal recognition that they too now have a role on the international stage. Bill Turnbull, BBC News, Kiev. The Chancellor of the Exchequer, Norman Lamont, has been holding talks with President Gorbachev in Moscow this afternoon. Mr Lamont is on a five-day visit to the Soviet Union to advise on economic reform. It's the Soviet Union. Before flying home to Washington, Mr. Bush gave a speech to the Ukrainian parliament. He said the rebel republic should support Mr. Gorbachev and not go in for what he called a suicidal course of isolation. But he said America's relations with individual republics were important. George Bush rode into the Ukrainian capital, Kiev, this afternoon with the shouts of nationalist demonstrators ringing in his ears. There's a growing separatist movement here and the Bush visit was seen by many as support for it, and a rebuke to the Kremlin for trying to stifle republics which want independence. But Mr. Bush wasn't prepared to get involved. He told the Ukrainian parliament that Mr. Gorbachev had his full support, and he warned against what he called the hopeless cause of isolation. We will not try to pick winners and losers in political competition between republics, or between republics in the center, that is your business. President Gorbachev has achieved astonishing things, and his policies of glasnost and perestroika and democratization point toward the goals of freedom, democracy, and economic liberty. This morning, the Kremlin snapped its smartest salute for George and Barbara Bush as they came to say goodbye to the Gorbachevs. It was the end of a round of summitry both sides are seeking to portray as a triumph, a watershed in relations between their two countries. Mr. Gorbachev's parting words, we've done good work. Mr. President, I shake your hand as a friend. Mr. Bush's last stop was at the site of a Nazi massacre in Kiev. Flanked by two US Marines, he paid a silent tribute to the victims. It's been a successful visit for the president, and it ended on a particularly sweet note. As he headed home, he was told of Israel's agreement to the peace conference he'd proposed yesterday. It's been a good summit for Mr. Gorbachev, too. The backing he's received from the White House has given his reforms a boost and left him more secure in the Kremlin tonight. Tim Hewitt, News at 10, Moscow. But now the Moscow summit is over, the Soviet people are left wondering what benefits they'll get from it and from the Western summit support from G7. They're already divided over Mr. Gorbachev's policies of glasnost and perestroika, praised by Mr. Bush. The first obvious benefit of the summit so far, a free day's travel on Moscow's metro underground system to mark the occasion. Moscow's metro carries eight million people daily to and from work in and around the city. All life is here, peasants on their way to market, commuters on their way to the office. Winners and losers in the new Soviet Union Mr. Gorbachev's trying to create supporters and opponents of reform. The worker, train driver Viktor Fomin, aged 42. He says he's come out of the last five years about even. A pay increase has compensated for higher prices and he's welcomed the political changes that have ushered in a Russian president and a friendly America. I'm still not sure about Gorbachev though, he says. I trust Yeltsin much more. And the passenger, 37-year-old Yelena Fyodorova. She describes herself as one of Perestroika's winners. A successful film director, new contacts with the West have brought her confidence and cash. Oh, yes, I'm optimistic. <laughs> I, I'm optimistic. The Metro's huge and grandiose stations were built in the 30s, some in honor of the Soviet worker, some in honor of the soldier. Igor and Ahmed don't feel much honored now. Their conscripts returning to base after six hours of solid labor. They've spent the last 18 months road digging, forced to do the work others will not. Their verdict, we've lost our pride and gained nothing in its place. And the pensioner, 65-year-old widow Tamara Semeniova, who works as a station cleaner because her pension leaves her well below the poverty line. She says she'd like to retire if her son would support her, but he plans to emigrate to America next year. She's one of Perestroika's losers. Mr. Gorbachev's reform plans have taken her son from her 
and left her far behind. Penny Marshall, News at 10, Moscow. Here, the number... ...subject to a referendum in December. And Boris Yeltsin has formally recognised the independence of Estonia and its neighbour Latvia. Mikhail Gorbachev's only public appearance today was at the funeral for three men who died in this week's military coup. Even here, he faced fierce criticism from anti-communists. For most of the day, the Soviet leader was locked in his Kremlin office, considering his political future and that of the Communist Party. When Mr. Gorbachev that, gave his first press uh, conference after the coup, he uh, said he'd remain loyal to the party. It left him badly out of step with public opinion. More signs of the prevailing mood today, a statue of Karl Marx in the center of Moscow, daubed in graffiti, which reads, workers of the world, forgive me. We suggest that uh, appropriate and formal decision be taken, that the party property should be passed over to the state, and that completely new party, or a consultation about the possibility of a having one, be started among the various representatives of different democratic and left-wing forces in this country. Former Foreign Minister Eduard Shevardnadze, once a close Gorbachev ally, said today he should have quit the party two years ago. Mr. Gorbachev himself was largely to blame for the coup. Meanwhile, the public humiliation of the leaders of that coup continues. This is Valentin Pavlov, the former Prime Minister, forced to sign his own arrest warrant in front of millions of TV viewers. He's now clearly a broken man. Former Defence Minister Dmitry Yazov wouldn't face the cameras, but publicly apologised to a Russian TV interviewer. And the cameras were there too when the office of former KGB chief Vladimir Kruchkov was unceremoniously searched for evidence of his treachery against Mr. Gorbachev. And the coup's most outspoken supporter, the party newspaper Pravda, was shut down today. Its future is uncertain as that of the party it's back so unswervingly for more than seven decades. Timu at ITN, Moscow. Earlier, thousands of people packed the centre of Moscow for the funerals of three men killed during the failed coup. President Gorbachev proclaimed the three heroes of the Soviet Union. He said there'd be no forgiveness for the leaders of the coup. It was officially the funeral of the three young Moscovites who had died defending the city during the military coup. But unofficially, many said, it was the funeral for a political system that is visibly disintegrating. President Gorbachev paid his respects. He owes his political life to Moscow's resistance to the military takeover. He awarded the victims the country's top honor, each becoming a hero of the Soviet Union. He told the crowd that the conspirators would be shown no forgiveness. He spoke slowly and with emotion. It is difficult, he said, to speak while looking into these young faces. But allow me on behalf of the country, on behalf of all Russians, to bow low before these young people. Those on the streets made no effort to hide their emotions. Everywhere a sense of loss and of a country in extraordinary political turmoil. The crowd then marched through the center of Moscow up towards the Russian parliament where resistance to the coup had been focused. The victims of this coup are being honored as revolutionary martyrs. For the people on the streets are seeing the events of the last week as nothing short of a revolution. Their hero remains Boris Yeltsin, the man who is now dominating Soviet politics. He told the crowd the hardliners were like cockroaches, that each was now blaming the others for attempting to seize power. Yeltsin supporters see the week's violence as a turning point. But they shed their blood defending democracy, and this is a funeral for the whole communism system all over the world. The images today were of old Russia, pre-revolutionary, 
a country throwing itself back 75 years. The patriarch of all Russia presided at the funerals. The atheism of the Soviet state utterly rejected. The changes here are not just political. People are talking of the re-emergence of a Russian tradition. Robert Moore, ITN, Moscow. Well, I'm joined now by our Moscow correspondent, Tim Ewart. Well, Tim, another quite extraordinary day in the Soviet Union. A very extraordinary day, Fiona. Events now seem to be moving much faster than Mr. Gorbachev can control them. He had come back from his uh, de uh, detention during the coup, still professing his loyalty to the Communist Party, but the coup had released a tremendous amount of pent-up anger against the party, which Mr. Gorbachev really hadn't appreciated. He was two or three steps behind everybody else, and what he's trying to do is to catch up, but he very well may have left it too late. Well, Mr. Gorbachev still remains Soviet president, but what sort of power does that give him? It doesn't give him very much at the moment, and it really all depends on what sort of an accommodation he can reach with Mr. Yeltsin. Mr. Yeltsin, for example, has today taken control of all government communications. He's looking more and more powerful. Mr. Gorbachev's, or one of Mr. Gorbachev's key power bases has always been the Communist Party. The future of the party literally hangs in the balance tonight. It may not recover. So he's looking increasingly weaker. Tim Muir in Moscow, thank you very much indeed. Cleared itself independent. Our correspondent in Moscow, Martin Sixsmith, now reports. The announcement on Soviet television this evening was blunt and to the point. Mr. Gorbachev had lost faith in the party and was taking decisive action. The television newsreader quoting at length from Mr. Gorbachev's declaration. The Central Committee of the Communist Party did not act to halt this week's coup. There were party leaders among the plotters. Under these conditions, the Communist Party of the Soviet Union must take the difficult but honest decision to dissolve itself. I no longer find it possible to fulfill the duties of the General Secretary of the Soviet Communist Party. And therefore, I renounce my position. I know that democratic communists will proceed to found a new party based on progressive principles. Mr. Gorbachev's only public engagement today was to meet the new American ambassador, and he used the occasion to promise rapid political changes. He made no mention of resignation at that point, but leading radicals have already seized on the speculation as proof that the old communist system is crumbling. Unfortunately, I don't possess any precise information about this, but I personally advised him long ago to take this step. It would have been greatly to his advantage if he had done this a year or a year and a half ago. Even Gorbachev to leave his party post as soon as possible. I think it, it will only strengthen his political position now and his uh, leadership. Uh, it would be much better for him if he could uh, make it uh, long ago. It's the atmosphere of impending political collapse here, with symbols of the old regime being torn down with breathtaking rapidity, that has made the suggestion of Mr. Gorbachev acting against the party largely credible. As the old Bolsheviks hit the ground, any links with an increasingly discredited party are coming to look like the kiss of political death. The terror which long held the Soviet people back from revolt has gone. The founder of the dreaded KGB removed from his plinth. And the power of the street now a real factor in political life. But Mr Gorbachev has remained stubbornly, some would say stupidly, loyal to the party. Even yesterday, he was responding to the virulent and widely felt wave of anti-communism with a denial that he was planning a ban. The Communist Party is a criminal organization and should be disbanded. When you say ban the party as a political organization, I can't agree. There are groups in the party who've hindered progress, and they must be dealt with. But to brand millions of people as criminals, I will never agree to do that. Boris Yeltsin, though, was his usual one step ahead of the Soviet president, publicly signing a ban on the Russian Communist Party and closing Pravda, the party newspaper which agreed to publish the statements of the coup leaders. Last night, Mr. Gorbachev ordered the sealing of the Communist Central Committee building. 
initiating a search for documents which could implicate the party as a whole in the plot against him. If such documents were found, it could be that Mr Gorbachev was finally convinced that the time has come for a break with the movement he's loved and believed in since he was a child. Son of a collective farm manager and party member, the young Mikhail naturally joined the Young Communist League, rising with great rapidity to the rank of local party boss in his home region of Stavropol, and eventually to the heights of communist distinction, which brought him the greatest rewards of party and state, but also linked him to the now discredited Leonid Brezhnev. Mr Gorbachev's response to last year's massive but still restrained public campaign to abolish Article 6 of the Constitution, guaranteeing the communist monopoly of power, illustrated his attachment to the party. He made concessions only slowly, culminating last month when he presented a program virtually transforming the Communist Party into a broad-based social democratic movement, hoping to emulate the path of reformist communists in Eastern Europe but once again giving too little and too late. The end of 74 years of communism in the Soviet Union has come in a whirlwind six days of drama, with the party leader virtually forced to destroy the movement that he loved, but millions had come to hate. For Mr Gorbachev, though, the change may have come too late. If he'd broken with communism even a month ago, he may have regained his place in the vanguard of political change here. But now he's been made to look weak and hesitant, forced to act only by the flow of events and, many will now say, by the decisiveness of Boris Yeltsin. Martin Sixsmith, BBC News, Moscow. For just a few hours today, the political ferment subsided as more than a million people went on to the streets of Moscow for the funeral of three people killed defending the Russian parliament on Tuesday. In a brief address, President Gorbachev told the crowd that there would be no forgiveness for the leaders of the coup. An older Russia, submerged by three quarters of a century of Marxism-Leninism, emerged today almost unchanged. As the pre-revolutionary Russian flag was draped over their coffins, the three young men who died had become martyrs for Russia, killed by a communist system which is now dying itself. The shooting of the three young men, an artist, an architect and a manual worker, has angered people to such an extent that it's bringing the whole communist system crashing down. And with it, the man who couldn't quite separate himself from it in time. Mikhail Gorbachev did his best to dissociate himself from the old system when he spoke. Let me as president, not only on my own behalf, but on behalf of the whole country, bow my head to these young people who gave their lives, standing in the way of those who wanted to crush democracy, to return to the old totalitarian regime and to push the country to the abyss of bloodshed. I bow low to them for all they did, and they did everything. They gave their lives. The cortege moved solemnly off, the biggest and most emotional event here since the funeral of Andrei Sakharov nearly two years ago. But as the trucks carrying the coffins stopped at the place where the deaths had occurred, what was different about today was the sense of the old Russia coming back to life. In a way, it was the Communist Party that died at this point as well. Even given all the extraordinary changes here in the last few years, I don't think anybody expected to see scenes like this in the middle of Moscow. Indeed, nothing like this has been seen in the Soviet Union since the revolution. The man who's captured the spirit of this national rebirth was waiting for them at the Russian parliament, the center of resistance to the attempted communist coup earlier this week. I bow to the mothers and fathers of Dmitry, Volodya and Ilya. Their names will be forever sacred for Russia. I ask you to forgive me, your president, that I was not able to save or protect your sons. The funeral service took place in one of the few Moscow churches where people were able to worship even during the worst of the religious repression. Two of the dead men were Orthodox Christians, and the Patriarch blessed their coffins. The third, Ilya Krychevsky, was Jewish. 
His family were unwilling at first to bury their son on the Sabbath and had wanted to wait until nightfall. Eventually, against their consciences, they agreed to let him be buried with the others as a gesture to the country as a whole. Now all three have the status of martyrs and their deaths have helped to bring Marxism-Leninism to an end in the country where it was invented and which has been so damaged by it. John Simpson, BBC News, Moscow. Today's declaration of independence by the Ukraine means that seven of the 15 republics have now announced their intention of leaving the Soviet Union. The Ukraine is the wealthiest and most populous of these, with 54 million people and vast grain and mineral resources. Others who want to break away are Armenia, Georgia and Moldavia, and the three Baltic republics of Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania, where progress towards independence is most advanced. Today, the Estonian government has joined Latvia and Lithuania in declaring the Communist Party illegal within its borders. And the Lithuanian president, Vitautis Landsbergis, has said he hopes to issue visas at the Republic's borders by Monday. Our correspondent, Kate Aidy, reports. In Estonia, there is now a 10-day plan of action aimed at bringing the country to a point where independence is irreversible. This morning, the foreign minister was warning of the Communist Party's continuing power, so speed, he said, was essential. In Latvia, the parliament in Riga has already passed legislation outlawing the party and detained its leader, actions which have brought cries of complaint from Moscow party headquarters of anti-communist hysteria. They might well complain. In Lithuania, party leaders had to scuttle out of their building in Vilnius in four armoured personnel carriers. Meanwhile, the headquarters of the KGB in Vilnius have been under siege. The officials, together with their own soldiers, trapped in their compound, with a quiet but determined crowd of Lithuanians outside. Again from Moscow, an appeal from the new head of the Soviet KGB for restraint to be shown and reprisals to be avoided. In Vilnius, the Lithuanian crowd showed just such restraint and decided to cheer the KGB's ignominious exit. And late this afternoon, the hardened troops of the Oman, the Ministry of Interior's force, which has acquired a particularly nasty reputation in the Baltic states, left their base, in some style and heavily armed, but leaving nevertheless. Kate Aidy, BBC News, Vilnius, Lithuania. There's been no reaction in Washington so far to the news of Mr. Joining the Baltics, Moldavia and Georgia in opting for secession, Yeltsin's rise to power will now mean much greater leeway for the republics and the seemingly unavoidable dismemberment of the Soviet Union. Martin Sixsmith, BBC News, Moscow. The American... Formerly quiescent Belarusia this evening, joining the Baltics, Moldavia and Georgia in opting for secession. Parliament in the Ukraine, the most powerful republic after Russia itself, declared independence last night, suggesting that the coup and Boris Yeltsin have so dislocated the structure of Soviet power that the centre can no longer hold. Martin Sixsmith, BBC News, Moscow. The Baltic republics, Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania, are moving closer to gaining international recognition as independent countries. Norway and Denmark say they're establishing diplomatic relations with the three republics. European foreign ministers meeting this week are being urged by the German foreign minister, Hans-Dietrich Genscher, to do the same. Belgium and France agree. The British Foreign Office Minister Douglas Hogg is to visit the Baltic Republic soon. The American Defence Secretary Dick Cheney says his country's recognition is only a matter of time. In Lithuania, President Landsbergis claims that full independence for the Baltic states is now a mere formality. Five days of turmoil and the Lithuanians are pausing for breath. The great organizers of life, the Communist Party and the KGB have gone. After sitting in continuous emergency session, Parliament is having a day off, but is still slightly nervous about the Oman, the feared troops of the Soviet Interior Ministry. Rooted out of their base in Vilnius yesterday, they're still in nearby Soviet army barracks while their final departure over the border is sorted out. For in their temporary base, they left the message, we'll meet again soon, something to send a shudder down Lithuanian spines. Beaumont spent this year exercising a special violence in both Latvia and Lithuania, 
last week taking over key buildings in support of the attempted coup. So the Parliament building still bristles with barricades. This government, ringed with barbed wire and sandbags, is being recognised by a growing number of countries. British diplomats are already here, dispatched swiftly from Moscow to make arrangements for a visit by the Foreign Office Minister, Douglas Hogg. It's all happening so quickly that the Lithuanians are talking about Baltic membership of the common market, their own new passports and visas and a new currency, even before they've taken down the barricades. The Lithuanian president has been on the phone to Boris Yeltsin in Moscow. Everything seems to be on course, with independence not so much a specific date, more a state of mind. But in all of this rush, today many Lithuanians went to the graves of those who were killed this year in defense of their country. Kate Aidy, BBC News, Vilnius, Lithuania. President Gorbachev will outline more changes to the Soviet system when he appears before a special session of the Supreme Soviet tomorrow. On the streets, people have celebrated the Communist Party's collapse, but they're worried about the future. Barricades were hastily dragged back into place around the Russian parliament today after rumours that Soviet tanks were approaching again. They made ready to defend it, preparing crates of Molotov cocktails. It was a false alarm, an indication though of the mood of uncertainty here. Furious political arguments have been sparked by the extraordinary upheavals of the past week and the removal of several monuments to communism. Some of the older generation are shocked at what has happened. Lenin and Dzerzhinsky saved the whole nation, this man said. I'm a historian, I know that man should stand forever. But that's the exception. Most feel a new and freer era has begun. For a long period we didn't have so much smiling faces in the street. Always we was gloomy, we was depressed and look to us. The queues and shortages though are evidence of the immense problems ahead. The black market is the only part of the economy that's thriving. Everything from jeans to foodstuffs can be bought but at exorbitant prices. Political freedom comes first and then the free people will be very capable of creating truly free economics without any uh, state uh, dominance. A big barrier is removed and this barrier was the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, it's no doubt about it. The statue of Mikhail Kalinin, a leading member of Stalin's government, is the latest to be removed. The plinth vandalized by souvenir hunters. And even the huge monument to Karl Marx has been disfigured. His words covered with anti-communist slogans. Carol Walker, BBC News, Moscow. The Communist Party hierarchy in Moscow have been enjoying what might well be their last weekend of privilege. Many are already having to surrender the perks that went with senior party status before the coup failed. Our foreign affairs editor John Simpson reports. Ten miles or so from the centre of Moscow and you could be in the depths of the country. It's one of the pleasantest features of the city and for that reason this area is reserved for senior Communist Party members and officials of different kinds. The bigger the job, the bigger the dacha and the bigger the loss if you fall from favour. Until last week this was the dacha of Boris Pugo, the interior minister who was one of the main figures in the coup and who committed suicide when it failed. The policeman on guard isn't keen on visitors. Other dachas are going empty too. For instance, that of General Kalinin, commandant of the Moscow military district. No one was in when we called. Not surprisingly, since he was sacked yesterday. We found a way in round the back. The general hadn't done much gardening recently. Still, the house itself had already been cleared out. Inside, only the government issue furniture remained. Apart from the dog, there was no one at the Communist Party Hotel either. We went upstairs. In the bedrooms, there were signs of hasty packing. The hotel doesn't belong to the party anymore, nor do the dachas. Still, you don't have to be a top politician to have a dacha, and a lot of families are getting nervous about whether they'll be able to keep theirs. In Moscow, for example, uh, we live in a two, in one bedroom apartment, you see, and during the summertime, 
it's rather difficult to stay in the house. But I understand that quite a lot of people in our country doesn't have any such possibilities. That's why it's not a great strike for me. If we lose it, maybe it's time to lose. Not far away, the families of Central Committee officials were enjoying a last game of tennis on their estate. Soon there'll be no Central Committee. This evening, people were packing up and leaving, anxious to get away before they're thrown out. Many feel it's a little unfair, especially those who tried to change the Communist Party. But then revolutions are never fair to everyone. John Simpson, BBC News, Moscow. Outside Moscow, the Communist Party has been the only means of running the economy and the country. So, what will happen tomorrow when the party is officially disbanded? A question I put a few minutes ago to Martin Sixsmith in Moscow. The first test will be tomorrow morning uh, when the uh, Communist Party local branches are meant to hand over their property uh, to the locally elected councils. They're meant to literally hand over the keys to their premises. Uh, but there's a double irony there because uh, many of the local councils are in fact led by communists themselves who got themselves ele elected through um, uh, certain rigged election procedures. So there's going to be a lot of confusion on the ground. So to what extent, when President Gorbachev appears tomorrow before the Supreme Soviet, will he again be on trial? I think it's not too much of an exaggeration to say that he is actually now fighting for his political life. His position has been tremendously weakened uh, over the past few days. Uh, he hasn't cut his links quite quickly enough with the old Communist Party. Boris Yeltsin has acted much more decisively than he has. Uh, Yeltsin has moved ahead while Mr Gorbachev has seemed to stand still. I think Mr Gorbachev has to, has to come out with a fairly powerful speech tomorrow morning at the Supreme Soviet if he's to retain any real influence in Soviet political Life. Other news, there's been more fierce fighting in Yugoslavia between the Croatian and... Step up the pace of reform following last week's failed coup. He told the Soviet Parliament of the Supreme Soviet there would be no more delay and no more compromise. And once the Union Treaty was signed, republics would be free to go their own way. The Ukrainian leadership has already suspended the local Communist Party because of its part in the coup. Earlier, the Speaker of the Soviet Parliament, Anatoly Lukyanov, resigned. He'd been denounced as the coup's ideologist. The deputies arriving at the Parliament were about to face a public examination of their conduct during the coup. The Supreme Soviet as a whole has been severely criticised for failing to oppose the plotters. And when Mr Gorbachev came to the podium, he was in serious mood, ready to accept part of the blame for not having removed the hardliners from power well before the coup. As president, I have to accept a large part of the responsibility for the coup. I have thought over many things during the past few days, and these tragic events have led me to certain conclusions. Mr. Gorbachev confirmed that the shock of the coup had made him rethink his political priorities and commit himself now to radical reform. Since I came back from the Crimea, I have been able to look at everything, the past and the present, and to look with new eyes. As long as I remain president, I will allow no hesitation in carrying out reforms. And from now on, there will be no compromises with those who oppose what we are doing. As the arguments continued over responsibility for the coup, Anatoly Lukyanov, the former Speaker of the Parliament and a long-time comrade of Mr Gorbachev, bowed to accusations that he was the driving force behind the plotters and resigned, still protesting his innocence. How could I betray a man to whom I have been connected for over 40 years? I was not the ideologist behind this coup and could not be. My position was made clear at the plenum. I said I would not sign any documents and not participate in this at all. Mr Gorbachev seems to have taken to heart the treachery of the communists. This afternoon, far from defending the party, he underlined the shift in his political loyalties by pledging allegiance to the West European ideal of social democracy. I am a man whose spirit is infused with the ideals of socialism. I am close to the ideals of Willy Brandt and to Swedish-style socialism. 
The first fruits of Mr. Gorbachev's born-again radicalism were a promise to open talks on independence with republics which want to leave the Union and a commitment to hold free presidential elections as soon as possible. Mr. Gorbachev now seemingly realizing that his only chance of winning those elections is to promise the far-reaching reforms that the people are demanding. There was some good news for the Soviet leader this afternoon, Boris Yeltsin's vice president confirming that he and Yeltsin would support Mr. Gorbachev in a presidential election. And with Yeltsin's credibility at an all-time high on the streets of Moscow, that endorsement could prove invaluable. Martin. The archives of the KGB are being seized and examined, opening up the possibility that thousands of cases of torture and internment could now come to light. The BBC's foreign affairs editor, John Simpson, has visited the headquarters of the KGB, the Lubyanka. He's the first television journalist to be allowed comprehensive access to what has been one of the most feared places in the Soviet Union. The Lubyanka used to be a place of genuine terror. Today, though, the KGB invited the BBC in to try to show us that it's a changed organisation. Outside, we could see where the statue of the father of the Soviet secret police had been taken down the other day. And the general who runs the KGB was very anxious to tell us how the revolution has changed things for them. When the criminal organization which attempted the coup was stopped, there were plenty of cheerful faces in the KGB. As a citizen, I felt good too. Though as a member of the KGB, I felt sad because of my colleagues who had joined the coup instead of upholding the law. In his bookshelf, the general had a book on the KGB by one of Britain's best agents, Oleg Gordievsky. But in the KGB museum, there was a whole section devoted to Philby, Burgess, McLean and Blunt. If there was a fifth man, he wasn't on show here. By this time, though, our minders were getting thoroughly nervous and they said it was time to go. No. But we were allowed to take a look at the prison within a prison where some of the most famous victims of the Soviet secret police have been held and broken in the past. Those days, our minders assured us, were over now for good. John Simpson, BBC News, Moscow. Political leaders throughout the world have been showing their willingness to recognize the independence of the Soviet Baltic Republics of Lithuania, Latvia and Estonia. Canada is to establish official links soon, and the United States says it will follow suit. Iceland became the first Western country to establish formal diplomatic relations with the three republics when it signed a treaty with their foreign ministers in Reykjavik today. France is to recommend EC recognition at a community meeting in Brussels tomorrow. Fierce fighting is continuing in the Yugoslav Republic. The Russian Republic wants a Russian veto on the Soviet Union's use of nuclear weapons. Boris Yeltsin's office said Russian ministers had been temporarily appointed to eight top posts in the Soviet government. The Georgian Supreme Soviet has been in emergency session. It's passed a resolution banning the Communist Party in Georgia. The Ukraine has suspended all activities of its Communist Party pending an inquiry. Political leaders throughout the world have been showing their willingness to re-establish diplomatic ties with the Soviet Baltic Republics of Lithuania, Latvia and... He told the Supreme Soviet that a week of turmoil had changed the Soviet Union beyond recognition. With the Soviet Union moving closer to breaking up, Gorbachev announced elections for the Soviet presidency and parliament. Eight republics have started moves towards independence. Russia called for a veto on the use of Soviet nuclear weapons, and Gorbachev denied that his wife, Raisa, has been dangerously ill. Now breaking up without him, this pro-independence rally in the Ukraine was just another example of the mood of separatism sweeping the nation. Local officials in the capital, Kiev, stormed the Communist Party headquarters, requisitioning documents and sealing offices. Party activity has been suspended. Mr. Gorbachev left the Supreme Soviet professing his support for Swedish-style socialism. A compromise on his earlier position, but one that still leaves him a step behind the prevailing atmosphere. In a chapel at the Kremlin, Russia continued to mourn those who died in the coup. Boris Yeltsin was there. His Russian Republic said today it reserved the right to review its borders with any republic which declared independence. Mr. Gorbachev seems unable to prevent the collapse of the Soviet Union, 
His union treaty looks increasingly irrelevant as more and more republics prepare to sever their links with the center. Tim at ITN, Moscow. President Bush has said the United States is very, very close to recognizing the Baltic Republic. Republics to declare independence. Mr. Gorbachev warned nothing will be achieved if we can't have a union. I will resign. In the last hour, European foreign ministers have agreed to recognize the independence of the Baltic states. The disintegration of the Soviet Union continued today. These were the scenes in Moldova, the eighth of the 15 republics to declare independence. A crowd of around 200,000 people celebrated their parliament's unanimous vote to sever links with Moscow. At the Supreme Soviet, Mikhail Gorbachev launched an impassioned plea for the preservation of the Union. Everything is collapsing, he warned. I'm for a renewed Union, a reformed Union. I'm for maintaining it. He said he'd resign if there wasn't agreement on a new Union treaty. In the Kremlin earlier, Mr. Gorbachev and the Russian leader Boris Yeltsin signed a treaty with two other republics, Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzia, on the creation of a joint economic zone. They hope others will join in. But there was little camaraderie on display in the Supreme Soviet. As more and more republics go their own way, there are mounting concerns about internal security. The mayor of the Russian city of Leningrad was worried about neighboring republics like the Ukraine forming their own armies. A Ukrainian MP accused the Russians of attempting to redraw their borders. And another deputy warned of a Yugoslavian-type civil war. The headquarters of the Russian Federation has become the symbol of the resistance to last week's coup. But many smaller republics fear that as Russia's power grows, it will simply swallow them up. Said this Kazakh deputy, it's all right for now because Boris Yeltsin's a Democrat. But what happens if he's replaced by a dictator? The authority of Russia is growing and the influence of Russia, the moral influence, and the economic influence of Russia is growing. It's the fact. And of course, this fact uh, intimidates some leaders of republics. Meanwhile, the effigies of Soviet power come under continuing assault, and the Soviet empire looks ever more fragile. At the Writers' Union in the Ukrainian capital, Kiev, they were dismantling yet another statue of Lenin. One more reminder of the old order, gleefully discarded. In the past, the might of the Soviet military and the KGB kept the lid on ethnic rivalries and disputes between the republics. But with the lid removed, the fear now is that old animosities could erupt into open conflict. Timu at ITN, Moscow. The Russian chief prosecutor told ITN today that hundreds of people might be arrested by investigators trying to track down the coup plotters. Ten have so far been detained. He also refused to rule out the death penalty if they're found guilty of treachery. Valentin Stepankov is a man with a mission. His task to find the guilty. It was Stepankov, the Russian prosecutor, who arrested the former Prime Minister, Valentin Pavlov. Also, Vladimir Khrushchev, ex-KGB chief, who apparently resisted. He just couldn't believe it was happening, Stepankov revealed today. And in an interview with ITN, he said his net was now widening. It's difficult to say. We just don't know how far the circle of conspirators stretches, he said. So far, we've charged 10 and are holding one more. But there could be 10, 20, maybe hundreds more now hiding in their datches. The radicals are using this opportunity to close in on their political opponents. And as they shut down Communist Party buildings, party members are running scared, shredding documents to cover their tracks. And adjusting to a life stripped of privilege. At this Communist Party garage today, cars were being handed back on the orders of the radicals. A thousand party volgars have now been locked up here. The former employees, today delirious. Sure you can hire a car, they told us, as long as you're not a communist. Just a month ago, Viktor Rabov used to enjoy the privileges and power accorded to a communist central committee member. Now he sits at home, a broken man. He's quit the party, quit politics. It's all over for us, he said sadly. And as he protested his innocence, the phone rang. It was another top communist running scared. Come over, Mr. Rabov said. I don't know what to do either. Look at this photo, he pleaded with us. 
My colleagues are now called traitors. The nation is divided like never before. Mr. Gorbachev may be the only one to survive this. Penny Marshall, ITN, Moscow. The Soviet spy George Blake spoke exclusively to ITN today and said that he won't be returning to Britain to serve the rest of his 42-year jail sentence. Blake escaped from Wormwood Scrubs in 1966 after serving just five years. Yeah, they will defend the interests of Russians, interests of Russians living in neighboring republics, and if necessary, review the borders. That's renewed fears of Russian dominance. There are 122 million Russians in Russia itself. In neighboring Ukraine, which now wants full independence, there are 11 million Russians, one-fifth of the population. In Kazakhstan, the largest Central Asian Republic, six and a half million Russians make up almost half the population. And in the Baltic Republics, there are 1.7 million Russians. Our correspondent, Martin Sixsmith, reports from Moscow on Mr. Gorbachev's latest attempts to keep the Soviet Union together. Mikhail Gorbachev may have signed his political death warrant today, finally staking his credibility on the preservation of the Soviet Union. I will tell you straight. I stand for the preservation of the Union, for the realization of the people's will, which they expressed at the referendum. I won't go down any other road. If this does not happen, if something else happens, I will resign and let someone else shoulder the burden. No good will come if we destroy the Union. No good at all. In contrast to yesterday's speech in which he spoke of republics being allowed to leave the Soviet Union, Mr. Gorbachev used today's address to make a powerful appeal for the Union to be preserved. The most tragic consequence of the failed coup was probably the impetus it gave to centrifugal forces accelerating the country's breakup. I view this development with concern and anxiety. Mr. Gorbachev has used the threat of resignation before and it has worked. But the danger for him this time is that he may have miscalculated. The demands for independence now so great that few are likely to heed his threat. Unfortunately for Mr. Gorbachev, the Soviet Union is now breaking up and it seems the process may not be peaceful. Demonstrators in the Moldovan capital, Kishinev, were today celebrating the Republic's Declaration of Independence, the eighth republic to declare its intention to leave the Union. But Moldova's Russian-speaking minority have also been on the streets, protesting against today's decision, a symptom of the complex web of interwoven ethnic groups which will have to be torn apart as the Union crumbles. In behind-the-scenes negotiations at the Soviet Parliament today, Mr. Gorbachev won the agreement of several republics to remain linked in an economic union. In the chamber, though, the republics were acting like potential enemies in a race to grab as much as possible from the country's disintegration. An aide of Boris Yeltsin announced that Russia was reserving the right to claim parts of neighboring republics if they had largely Russian populations, sparking vehement denunciations of intimidation and Russian expansionism. Russia is becoming a new imperialist. It must withdraw its statement about redrawing the borders, otherwise we'll all perish. We all defended the Russian parliament, and that should lead us to civil peace. Instead, it could be civil war. Mr. Gorbachev, watching warily as the country he's led for six years enters its death throes, is now cast in the thankless role of referee between competing demands from the republics, still pledged to maintaining a semblance of unity and clearly worried by Boris Yeltsin's expansionist tendencies. All the statements and decisions and speeches on these issues from the Russian leadership are a particular discussion, and I don't think they are a final position. It's clear we are not going to review any borders. Boris Yeltsin has been the winner in the events of the past week, emerging with unprecedented political authority. But for him, the danger is that the changes that have affected the country could unleash centrifugal tendencies even within his own Russian Republic. Radical politicians have welcomed the disintegration of the old Soviet Union, Leningrad Mayor Anatoly Subchak warned that the process must not be allowed to lead to conflict. We must agree on the future principles of our coexistence. 
They could be like the British Commonwealth or like the European Community, but Gorbachev is the president. He must resign if he cannot resolve these questions. Outside the Supreme Soviet today, ordinary Russians were still visiting Lenin's mausoleum, less to admire the man who brought them 70 years of communism than to say farewell to a long embalmed corpse that may soon be given a proper burial. Martin Sixsmith, BBC News, Moscow. The 12 European Community countries have agreed unanimously to recognize the independence of the three Soviet Baltic republics. Lithuania, Latvia and Estonia have been stepping up their campaign for international recognition since the failed coup in Moscow last week. Denmark has already appointed an ambassador to the three states and he began work today. Britain has been advising caution, but the Foreign Secretary, Douglas Hurd, says the time is now right for recognition. The junior Foreign Office Minister, Douglas Hogg, is leaving shortly for the Baltic to discuss resuming relations. From Brussels, our Europe reporter, Jonathan Charles. Germany's Foreign Minister arriving to tell the meeting his country has decided already to recognize the three Baltic republics. Most of Hans-Dietrich Genscher's colleagues made it clear they too believe the EC had to follow suit. Now the Russian Federation, seeking to exert its growing power, is demanding a joint system of military authority. The Republic's Vice President, Alexander Rutskoy, said this would prevent a repetition of what happened during the attempted coup, when the country's nuclear capability appeared to fall into the hands of the conspirators. As the tanks were sent onto the streets, Gennady Yanayev's men are reported to have seized President Gorbachev's briefcase containing nuclear launch codes. The complex web of technical safeguards meant there was little danger of an imminent nuclear strike. The codes have to be matched and activated at closely guarded installations. But the whole episode certainly alarmed analysts here. I shudder to think, retrospectively now, that with these terrible weapons in their possession, they could have been quite desperate sometimes and may uh, have uh, done things which could have put our country, or for this matter, the entire world, on the brink of catastrophe. In negotiating the series of treaties aimed at reducing the nuclear threat, Western leaders have dealt with a single Soviet government. That's the way they want to continue. President Gorbachev is the man they like to do business with. But he may find it difficult to resist the demands of the Russian president now. There is clearly grave concern in the West over who controls the nuclear arsenal. But a Russian veto on the nuclear trigger could be seen as a further safeguard, even if the prospect of such weapons in Mr Yeltsin's grasp is abhorrent to the hardliners. I would rather they were in the trembling hands of Mr Gorbachev than in the hands of Boris Yeltsin, was the reaction of General Nikolai Petroshenko. The independence of republics such as the Ukraine presents the greatest immediate threat, Though most nuclear weapons are in Russia, the Ukraine has both long-range and tactical missiles. The Republic's leaders are worried about future Russian dominance, and they've declared control of all military concerns on Ukrainian territory. Even leading reformers say that is madness. We need to remember this. We live in a country stuffed with nuclear warheads. And there is no small amount of nuclear weaponry on the territory of Ukraine. Any kind of claim by one republic or another that some of the armed forces or some of the weaponry should be handed over to its control is inadmissible. The whole structure of the Soviet army may have to be reassessed now, though the Kremlin's new defense chief has said the nuclear forces will remain under central command. There is the fear of what diplomatic sources here have called a nightmare scenario, the breakup of the Soviet Union with some of its republics becoming nuclear powers. Carol Walker, BBC News, Moscow. Later in this programme, I'll be talking to our correspondent Martin Sixsmith about developments in Moscow and the republics. But first, today's other main stories. Fierce fighting has been going on. That Gorbachev has reacted to foreign recognition of the Baltic states by saying that it's too hasty. What hope is there of him maintaining the union nevertheless? 
I think a very slim hope indeed, uh, and I'm rather surprised that he has pinned his colours to the mass so firmly today, uh, pinning really his whole political credibility on keeping the Soviet Union together. Uh, his threat to resign was uh, made more in sorrow than in anger, but it was nonetheless a threat. And I think he's now simply ignoring a lot of things that are going on. He said that the Ukraine's declaration of independence was merely a tactical reaction to the coup. Uh, he says he doesn't believe that Boris Yeltsin has these expansionist tendencies that we've been uh, seeing in the last couple of days. I think he's really trying to ignore some unpleasant uh, developments from his point of view, but he, he'll find out in the long run he can't ignore them. And if he does pin his colours to the mast of keeping the Soviet Union together, uh, I think in the end it may have been a, a very dangerous tactical mistake for him. What sort of organisation do you think is going to emerge now? There's been talk of a, of a new Commonwealth. Yes, uh, all sorts of ideas are floating around now for how the uh, 15 republics uh, uh, will organise their uh, coexistence in the future. They're clearly not going to be one unified state as they have been for the Soviet Union uh, for the past 70 years. That idea clearly is dead. Uh, but they now have to put something in its place. It could be a loose confederation. It could simply be a, an economic agreement for them all to trade together. Uh, that's something that has to be worked out. And the real question is whether that can be worked out without violence and conflict. Martin, thank you very much. And that's all from the News at Six this evening. There'll be more at nine from Andrew and from me. Good night. ...based in the Russian Republic. But the Ukraine, which wants independence, has the second largest number of nuclear weapons. And Kazakhstan, which also wants greater control of its own affairs, has a number of nuclear test sites and installations. A struggle for control of the world's biggest nuclear arsenal is something the West has long feared. Now the Russian Federation, seeking to exert its growing power, is demanding a joint system of military authority. The Republic's Vice President, Alexander Rutskoy, said this would prevent a repetition of what happened during the attempted coup, when the country's nuclear capability appeared to fall into the hands of the conspirators. As the tanks were sent onto the streets, Gennady Yanayev's men are reported to have seized President Gorbachev's briefcase containing nuclear launch codes. The complex web of technical safeguards meant there was little danger of an imminent nuclear strike. The codes have to be matched and activated at closely guarded installations. The independence of republics such as the Ukraine presents the greatest immediate threat. Though most nuclear weapons are in Russia, the Ukraine has both long-range and tactical missiles. The Republic's leaders are worried about future Russian dominance and they've declared control of all military concerns on Ukrainian territory. Even leading reformers say that is madness. We need to remember this. We live in a country stuffed with nuclear warheads. And there is no small amount of nuclear weaponry on the territory of Ukraine. Any kind of claim by one republic or another that some of the armed forces or some of the weaponry should be handed over to its control is inadmissible. There is clearly grave concern in the West over who controls the nuclear arsenal. But a Russian veto on the nuclear trigger could be seen as a further safeguard, even if the prospect of such weapons in Mr Yeltsin's grasp is abhorrent to the hardliners. I would rather they were in the trembling hands of Mr Gorbachev than in the hands of Boris Yeltsin, was the reaction of General Nikolai Petroshenko. The whole structure of the Soviet army may have to be reassessed now, though the Kremlin's new defence chief has said the nuclear forces will remain under central command. There is the fear of what diplomatic sources here have called a nightmare scenario, the breakup of the Soviet Union with some of its republics becoming nuclear powers. Carol Walker, BBC News, Moscow. Now other news. In Yugoslavia, to declare independence. The European community went against him too. Its foreign ministers agreed to recognize the independence of the three Baltic republics, Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania. Mr. Major said he'd visit President Gorbachev in Moscow this weekend. In Moldova, members of the parliament cheered and cried with joy after the unanimous vote for independence. It takes effect immediately. Moldova was part of Romania until 1940, when it was annexed by the Soviet Union in the Hitler-Stalin Pact on Eastern Europe, and Romania was the first country today to recognise it. 2.30 this afternoon in the Moldovan capital, Kishinev, and the crowd are waiting for news from Parliament that the Republic has declared independence from Moscow. 
Church bells ringing throughout the Republic will be the first sign that they've turned their back on the Soviet Union. For the people of Moldova, it was a moment of euphoria. Their opening minutes of national independence. Seen from here, the overwhelming parliamentary vote mirrored in the crowd was proof that the USSR is no more, that the Soviet Empire has been shattered by nationalist demands. Almost no one in the former Soviet republics believes the country can now be held together. So great is the loss of confidence in Moscow. And in the parliament, an historic moment for a country that, like the Baltics, was carved into the Soviet Union by the wartime pact between Nazi Germany and Stalin's Russia. Moldova's president, Mircea Snega, told us this was the end of the Kremlin's empire in Europe. All that is left now, he said, is the empire in Central Asia. Outside, more evidence of what independence really means. The Red Army now replaced by a National Guard. Every republic is building up its own army. If on the streets outside there was an intoxicating sense of history, in Moldova's Communist Party headquarters there was a sense of utter defeat. We were taken inside the Central Committee and shown how every office is now sealed. Special investigators are now searching for documents. And if proof can be found of communist misrule or of corruption, then criminal charges will be brought. The papers were being piled up in sacks. With communism crushed, there's a mood for justice, a desire for retribution. The building was seized by nationalists on Friday evening. By today, the communists were a hounded group, unable even to meet each other in public. Despite the rain this evening, it did nothing to dampen the excitement. The Soviet republics have seized the opportunity of a generation, exploiting the political chaos in Moscow. Moldova today claimed its reward. No longer a Soviet republic, but an independent country. Robert Moore, News at 10, in Kishniev. Mikhail Gorbachev went on the offensive to prevent the disintegration of the Soviet Union. Today, in a fiery speech to the Supreme Soviet, he warned, everything is collapsing. I'm for a renewed union, a reformed union. I'm for maintaining it. And he threatened to resign if there wasn't agreement on a new union treaty. Earlier, he met Boris Yeltsin for talks in the Kremlin, which laid the ground for agreement on a new economic zone between Russia and two other republics. It's hoped others will join in. But the political atmosphere remains divisive. The Russian mayor of Leningrad was worried about neighboring Ukraine forming its own army. The Ukrainians accused the Russians of attempting to redraw their borders, and one deputy warned of a Yugoslav-type civil war. The focus of discontent is Boris Yeltsin's increasingly powerful Russian parliament. Mr. Yeltsin led resistance to last week's coup but many smaller republics now fear Russia wants to dominate them. I respect Boris Yeltsin, as many of you here probably know. However, I have to tell you that what is going on now is overdoing things. Comrades, this is again neo-Bolshevik excess. And with that, this Armenian MP resigned from the Supreme Soviet. But in the confused corridors of power, there was this evening a body of opinion rallying behind Mr. Gorbachev and his appeal for Soviet unity. Uh, we cannot simply uh, dissolve the Union overnight. It's too serious question. Uh, we have a tremendous nuclear arsenal, uh, a tremendous army. Uh, we have uh, a one unificated uh, system of uh, energy supply. And tonight, Mr. Gorbachev warned again, we cannot split up. The destruction of the Union, he said, would have a dangerously destabilizing effect. But as the effigies of Soviet power come under continuing assault, the Soviet Empire looks even more fragile. In the Ukrainian capital, Kiev, they were dismantling yet another statue of Lenin, the old order gleefully discarded.
That old order kept the lid on ethnic rivalries and nationalist ambitions. But now there's no effective central control left. And Mr Gorbachev's arguments alone may not be enough to maintain a unity in the past preserved by force. Tim Hewitt, News at 10, Moscow. The European Community Foreign Ministers announced their recognition of the Baltic Republics as independent states. And they said tonight it was time the states resumed their rightful place among the nations of Europe. They said the EC will be putting forward proposals on economic aid to the three republics, Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania. There was no dispute with ethnic violence. A small flat at the back of a terraced London house has today been transformed from a historical curiosity to a functioning centre of modern diplomacy. This is the Latvian mission where they preserved what was, until today, a fiction, that Latvia was an independent state recognised by the international community. History gave some grounds for hoping that the fiction would become a reality. Latvia and the other Baltic states did enjoy a period of independence between the world wars. It was snuffed out when the foreign ministers of Hitler and Stalin did a deal to incorporate the Baltics into the Soviet Union. But it remains one of the factors distinguishing the Baltics from the Soviet Union's other republics. The disintegration of the Soviet Union is proceeding apace. Seven republics, including, of course, the three Baltic states, have already declared independence, and one of them, Moldova, may eventually abandon its Soviet links altogether and merge with Romania. Armenia has announced its intention to secede, and Uzbekistan is drafting legislation on independence. Of paramount importance to the rest of the world, future control of the Soviet Union's nuclear weaponry. Boris Yeltsin's demand for an effective veto over the use of nuclear forces should, if anything, make control tighter. But it's by no means clear what the future chain of command will be or who will continue the process of arms control that President Gorbachev began. The vast majority of the Soviet Union's 30,000 nuclear warheads are scattered across Russia. The Soviets are thought to have removed most of those which were sited in Azerbaijan and Armenia, but it's believed there are mobile SS-18s in northern Kazakhstan and there are still large numbers of missiles in the Ukraine. Well, the bulk of the uh, Soviet nuclear forces are in Russia or on Russian soil or under Russian control because in the Soviet armed forces the bulk of the senior officers and those with control are actually ethnic Russians and so I think you can safely say that uh, it's almost now a, a Russian uh, nuclear force. The best guess at the moment is that Russia itself will dominate the nuclear stakes but there are very important facilities in other republics and it's quite possible that you could end up with as many as four nuclear weapon states. The three key republics, Russia, Belarusia and Ukraine and possibly Kazakhstan as well. The danger of ethnic conflict surfacing in the new order of what was the Soviet Union is real. This was a demonstration by Russians living in Lithuania. Most of the Soviet Union's republics are ethnically mixed. Russians spread throughout the Union. All the Baltic republics have substantial Russian minorities the largest in Latvia is a third of the population. A fifth of those who live in the Ukraine are Russian, as are significant numbers in Moldova and Kyrgyzia. And as much as 40% of the population of Kazakhstan are ethnic Russians. Yeltsin cannot afford the possibility of millions of Russians fleeing from these republics in the event of inter-ethnic conflict, dumping themselves on Russia proper, becoming refugees, becoming an economic problem in terms of food and supply, in terms of housing and, of course, in terms of political instability. The other critical question that will have to be addressed, the economic relationship between the newly independent states, which until now have worked with one currency under one central economic authority. A snapshot that illustrates the way the economies of the republics are integrated. Russia supplies almost all the energy that Lithuania uses. Lithuania, in turn, supplies 30% of Moscow's milk and 20% of its meat. In the short term, the Soviet Union must have some degree of economic organization. Otherwise, there would be chaos. Chaos could lead to hunger and starvation, and that in turn could lead to political instability. There's been something of a scramble to recognize the Baltic states today. Norway joined in this morning. There may be less enthusiasm in the West for granting the same privilege to other Soviet republics, at least until new structures are firmly in place. Russian, not Soviet, officials are leading the hunt for the plotters of the coup. The chief Russian prosecutor said the net for the suspects is still widening. Hundreds could be eventually arrested, he said.
Now it's Russian television that is asking viewers to phone up with information on anyone they suspect. The failure of the coup has spawned a new group of plotters. Radical activists now removing anything or anyone who previously blocked their attempts at reform. Here at the Smolny Palace in Leningrad, from where Lenin issued orders to his Bolsheviks in 1917, Yeltsin's Russian Guard now follow theirs. They've commandeered the Communist Party headquarters. They've suspended its half a million members. The party boss is in hiding. His deputy, Yuri Belov, is under investigation. And as these new revolutionary foot soldiers seize control of the Communist Party infrastructure, hear the hotline to the Kremlin, so they take control of Russia. Indeed, it's the Russian prosecutor, Valentin Stepankov, and not his Soviet counterpart, who's leading the investigation into the coup conspirators. He himself arrested former Prime Minister Pavlov and the ex-KGB chief, Vladimir Khrushchev, who, it was revealed today, initially resisted arrest. Stepankov told ITN that his net was now widening. It's difficult to say, he said. We just don't know how far the circle of conspirators stretches. Now we have 10 people under arrest and another one charged, but we could be looking for another 10, 20, maybe hundreds more, who are even now hiding in their dachas. The accused, this is Vasily Starodubtev, head of the Peasants' Union, who was arrested by Stepankov at the weekend, all have access to lawyers. But the law's confused. Under whose authority are you acting, Starodubtev asked. Under Russia's, said the prosecutor. Well, I don't recognize Russian law, only Soviet. Sign anyway, Starodubtev was ordered. There's now a real fear that as Russia asserts its radicalism, it will wreak revenge on some innocents. The Russian news is inviting viewers nightly to phone the prosecutor's office direct with any documentary evidence which implicates others in the coup. This was Viktor Rabov, member of the Communist Central Committee, talking to ITN two months ago, confident, powerful and committed. This is him today, at home, a broken man. Before and after, winners and losers. He quit the party on Friday, too late to remain untainted by the conspiracy. And as he protested his innocence to us, the phone rang. It was another top communist running scared. Come over, let's talk. I don't know what to do either, Rabov said sadly. What he does do may depend on his neighbor, Boris Yeltsin, who lives in the same apartment block. He must now reassure his critics that he can curb any radical excesses. So far in Moscow, there's only good humored relief. At this car compound for party volgars, a thousand cars now stand locked up on Mr. Yeltsin's orders, much to the gratification of the former employees. Sure, you can hire a car, they said today, as long as you're not a communist. But as the economic crisis continues unabated, the radicals may find they have to blame someone else for it. And the communists are covering their tracks shredding documents as they leave a disintegrating union and a crumbling economy in the hands of the radicals. Penny Marshall, News at 10, Moscow. The double agent, George Blake, has... ...and survivors of the original group and six other officials were charged with high treason. They faced the death penalty. And at KGB headquarters, where the toppled statue of founder Felix Zerzhinsky is now a symbol of the new democracy, the entire governing body was dissolved. The KGB's Lubyanka building was the ominous focus of Soviet power for more than 70 years. This is the office of its director, the nerve center of an organization which now admits killing 4 million people, a figure others put at nearly 40 million. But young KGB officers said they welcomed today's dismissals. They deserve to be sacked, said one. His colleague added, all the rank-and-file KGB people supported reform. Mr Gorbachev told ITN the security of the country would no longer be limited to the activities of one service. And critics of the KGB said the organization should undergo sweeping change. Well, it's only the beginning. A victory is still ahead. Uh, victory is when the society will sigh freely and will be protected from the uh, return of this ominous power we had for 75 years. Today we are only in the initial stage, so it will take quite some time. But we have to do it fast, I say. We have to do it quickly. Otherwise they will regroup and attack back. The former Supreme Soviet speaker Anatoly Lukyanov is to be investigated for his role in the coup. I was not a conspirator, he insisted today. And many legislators are becoming uneasy about what they see as a witch hunt 
and a lust for revenge. The Russian people are not known for their liberal views on crime and punishment. In a recent survey, 35% said all homosexuals should be executed. I'm afraid that under the present circumstances, the people are bloodthirsty. And uh, therefore, I'm afraid that there will be demands for most uh, cruel uh, sentence. Mr. Gorbachev's other concern today was the growing influence of Boris Yeltsin. He warned his Russian parliament that it must still abide by Soviet law. Everything must be based on the constitution and cooperation. In a decree today, Mr. Yeltsin demanded all foreign exchange operations be subject to his Russian jurisdiction. And he proposed that nuclear weapons based in the Ukraine should be transferred to Russian soil if the Ukraine becomes independent. A joint delegation from the Soviet and Russian parliaments went to the Ukraine for urgent talks. Moves towards independence there have raised more alarm than in any other republic. And there's growing unrest elsewhere. This is the Azerbaijani capital, Baku, where 300,000 people took to the streets to demand that Communist Party assets be seized. The ultimate humiliation was proposed by the mayor of Moscow tonight. He said the remains of Lenin could soon be removed from the Red Square Mausoleum, the party's most sacred monument. Mr. Gorbachev has cleared the decks and is acting with renewed confidence. But he faces the mammoth task of rebuilding a Soviet leadership structure, one powerful enough to withstand the challenge from Boris Yeltsin. Timuit News at 10, Moscow. The Soviet ambassador to London, Mr. Leonid Zamyatin, is being called back to to explain why... Good evening. The disintegration of the old Soviet Union moved closer today when its two most powerful republics, Russia and the Ukraine, signed their own military and economic agreement without consulting the Kremlin. They invited other states of what they called the former USSR to join them. Mr. Gorbachev's efforts to hold the Union together ran into difficulties today. The Soviet Parliament wouldn't agree immediately to the new Security Council of Reformers that he wants. And Edvard Shevardnadze, the former foreign minister whom he asked to join that council, said he didn't want the job anyway. The parliament did suspend the Communist Party across the entire Soviet Union, freezing its bank accounts and stopping its operations. The suspension will become a permanent legal ban on the party if it's proved to have played a part in last week's coup. Anti-communist feeling was building up in the parliament, about to overflow into a campaign of retribution against the party, which seems certain to finish it off as a political force here. Appeals for understanding by the communists made little impression, and a parliamentary spokesman produced a bombshell, brandishing an official telegram, which he said proved that the party's central committee had given its formal backing to the coup leaders. The final vote condemning the party and calling for a legal investigation of its conduct, adding that if the charges of complicity in the coup were proven, the party should be banned forever. The purge of those involved with the plotters is gathering pace. The former speaker of the Supreme Soviet, Anatoly Lukyanov, harried by accusations that he was the driving force behind the takeover, was this morning officially named as a wanted man. Comrade deputies, in the course of our inquiries, we have received very serious evidence that Anatoly Lukyanov, the Speaker of the Supreme Soviet, took part in the plot to seize power with the other members of the State Emergency Committee. Therefore, I call on you to lift his parliamentary immunity and allow the arrest of Anatoly Lukyanov. The vote to remove Lukyanov's parliamentary immunity and to hand him over to face a possible death penalty on treason charges was overwhelming. Lukyanov's downfall today was followed immediately by the resignation of the man who just demanded his arrest. The Soviet prosecutor himself accepting responsibility for his own behavior during the coup and offering to step down. Some of the plotters, though, have escaped the grasp of earthly justice. Marshal Sergei Akramyev, buried today with military honours, was once Mr. Gorbachev's top adviser on disarmament. He backed the coup, he said, to protect the socialist achievements he'd fought for all his life. When the takeover failed, he hanged himself.
In Parliament tonight, Mr Gorbachev presented his nominees to replace the hardliners removed in the purge, most of them liberals like Vadim Bakartin, who easily won the deputy's approval as head of the KGB, an organisation he's pledged to disband. And Yevgeny Shapashnikov, who was confirmed as the new defence minister. He's another liberal who opposed the use of the army during the coup. The collapse of communism has led Mr Gorbachev to appoint the most radical team of advisers of his political career. And with the Republic seemingly on the brink of conflict, his newfound liberal credibility may yet allow him to play an influential role, if not ruling from the centre, at least acting as a necessary referee between competing Republican interests. Martin Sixsmith, BBC News, Moscow. Tensions between Moscow and the Soviet Republics remain high. Mr Gorbachev says the situation in Kazakhstan has become very aggravated and the Russian Vice President Alexander Rutskoy has gone there tonight to try to defuse the row over their border. In Kazakhstan, President Nazarbayev has closed down the Soviet Union's main testing site for nuclear weapons. The Russian President Boris Yeltsin is in Latvia tonight for a secret meeting with the Republic's leaders. And in Ukraine, today's deal with Russia has been described as a model for other deals between the republics. From Ukraine, Carol Walker reports. A hostile crowd gathered to greet the Russian delegation. Ukrainians were angered by a statement from a Russian spokesman suggesting the republic could review the borders with its neighbours. The talks lasting 11 hours were stormy. But the two richest and most powerful republics emerged with an agreement to form a temporary economic and military alliance. They invited other former subjects of the Soviet Union to join them, a clear reference to the end of the old Soviet structure. Both sides insisted they had no claim on the other's territory. We've reached a mutual understanding. It has not been easy. With the signing of this communique, we've fulfilled an important role to stabilize the relationship between our two republics to avoid conflict. For the first time in our history, there have been anti-Russian banners in our square. They are not representative, but they came from a mood which could have got worse if we had not signed this agreement. But outside, the crowd chanted Ukraine without Moscow, as the leading reformer Anatoly Sobchak, here as part of a Soviet parliamentary delegation, spoke of economic and political bonds. While the Russian minority here have welcomed the accord, many Ukrainian nationalists fear that despite Russia's avowedly democratic leadership, an imperialist Russia will emerge to swallow up its newly independent neighbor. Big brother, it's Russia, it's big brother. Uh, it's no good, no. Uh, Sobchak and Rutskoy came uh, to, uh, how do you put it in English, to tear off uh, Ukraine's arms. Many people here find it hard to trust the Russians. They blame them for years of suppression of the Ukrainian culture. And despite the new agreement, they're worried that Russia may not accept the Ukraine as an equal partner. Several thousand monuments to the heroes of communism are to be removed. For the Ukrainian people, these represent not just an outdated ideology, but the influence of a foreign power, which tried to submerge the Ukrainian national identity. Carol Walker, BBC News, Kiev. The Prime Minister and President Bush said today there won't be a fundamental change in policy. To a draft treaty between the republics of Russia and the Ukraine, creating a military and economic alliance. It was a further boost to Boris Yeltsin's influence. Before the coup, Russia was, uh, I mean, Moscow was the center of conservative impulses, trying to prevent republics from becoming free. Now Russia is the source of a very strong, powerful, revolutionary and democratic impulse. A sentiment Mr. Gorbachev echoed tonight. I've returned to a different country, he said. And it's a country showing more signs of stress tonight Kazakhstan, the second largest republic and hitherto loyal to the Union, has warned that it too may declare independence unless Russia renounces claims to part of its territory. Timuit News at 10, Moscow.